would like to welcome everyone here to Crab Jab Studio. And um, whoops. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming for this evening for the Lennon Show, the Lennon, Lennon Opening Reception, uh, featuring uh, nine artists, which also includes May Pang and Tim Bruckner, who are here in attendance tonight. Um, <laughs> Very quickly, I want to give a huge, huge thank you to uh, both Rick and Josh of Apple Jam, who have been playing this evening. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I just want to say very quickly that a little later this evening, after we're done with the um, with the uh, with the artist talk, uh, they will be playing a very special set of music that inspired this show. So all the pieces uh, actually were inspired by various songs of uh, John and the Beatles, so they will be playing that. Um, so stick around because it really adds a, a wonderful ambience to the show in general. Um, anyway, I know that many of you are here to listen to both Tim and May talk about their work here, um, except that they are both contracted not to talk about John Lennon, so um, <laughs> sadly we can't talk about him. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, they will be talking about Ringo Starr. No. Um, My favorite. <laughs> so um, I'm going to go ahead and give the mic over. Give the mic over to May. Both of them will be talking uh, uh, one after another, uh, and they will both be asked or answering questions. So uh, when they are done speaking, you are welcome to ask questions, um, and they are. are Happy to answer anything you have. Again, thank you, you guys, for coming. Um, well, yeah, I mean, within reason, right? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and thank you very much. And I'm going to hand this over to May. There you go. Thank you, Julie. There you go. Um, anyway, a lot of you come tonight, and uh, I think a few of you might know me, and some of you've never heard of me. Um, and some of you do, so, but here I am with some photos, some uh, limited editions of photographs of, of my time with John, um, as they call it back then, the lost weekend. <laughs> and obviously it wasn't so lost when you start to figure out all the stuff that went on in that time period. In fact, he worked more than he ever did on, in his solo career. So we've done a lot of work, and I chose nine photos because a lot of you, if you're a Beatle fan or a John Lennon fan, you know that his favorite number was number nine. So I looked at the photos, and um, I asked which ones were speaking to me, and then I chose that, and I brought them out. And this is, and each one has um, a title, because that's how I saw it. A, a few of you came up and actually said you like the cynic. That was his look when he didn't want to speak. You know, he goes, yeah, okay, fine. What do you want? Um, but it, it, it gives me um, a lot of pleasure when I see pictures of the ones that I took of him with, you know, with the other guys. Unfortunately, I didn't have one with George because I was busy trying to put them back together as well. But it was nice to also know the picture of him and Julian that he hadn't seen in three years. And so to get them together, those are those are the precious photo. Uh, I didn't put out, I, and I never did, um, was the photo of John and Paul, but that, that you can see in my book. So there's limited copies left of, because uh, it's out of print, which is an Instamatic Karma book, which is being sold here. And, um, and that's how it started. And then uh, we also have Tim, who will come up and speak, and this is all inspired no, he's not speaking either. Okay, so we both know that we're going to be mute tonight. But anyway, so this is how it all started. And I know a lot of you have questions because you've come back to where I was sitting and started asking me a lot of questions. So, but if I'm going to leave it to the floor because I know that um, a few of you really do have questions. Anybody want to start? Come on. You're, you're, you're dying to ask me questions while I'm sitting back there, but nobody wants to say anything while I'm sitting here. Okay, come on, come on. Someone. Anybody have a question for me? <laughs> wow, I can't. Okay. When you were taking the pictures, the photos, mm -hmm. did you realize that someday that you might do something with them, or was it just for fun at that time? You know, it's funny because when John started to look at my photos, I was I was just a it's like a hobby, 
and I loved photography, so I started taking pictures. And John would say to me after he saw his photos, that the way I was taking them, he says, you know, it's something. He said he kept saying to me, I've never seen myself. I've never seen myself in this type of lighting. I really like the way I look, because he was very particular, and he let me take photos of all the time. And there is one photo that's, I don't know if I, uh, I don't think I have it here, I'm not sure. It's one with the dogs, that he has the dogs, it's in the book. And he loved that picture so much, he asked if he could use it for the single of Imagine in Europe. So, which of course I said, you can use that. Um, maybe I should have charged. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I let him use it, and uh, you know that's really how it started. But I never thought about it being anything more than just me taking photos of him. Yeah. I mean, a lot of this, um, obviously, it's it's really for my own personal collection. It's out of my own, you know. I, I had them for so long. I, you know, they were just in a drawer in the closet underneath the bed wherever I was moving, and people would just say, wow, I've never seen photos like this. And I never thought about putting it out on display. But it started, people were coming, they, this should go out, people should see what he looked like back then. Because everybody thought of him as this disruptive person out there, and drunken and thrown out of places, but that's not the way it was. The stories have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> Someone else? That would be great. Uh, we know that he was a great singer who hated his voice sometimes because he always wanted it, you know, distorted and things like that. And he was, uh, as far as like the pictures, whatever any he looked at that he said, oh, hide that one or don't, don't show that other one or anything like that. Believe it or not, no, mm -hmm. he didn't. He really didn't. And it, and it, I guess you know, it was something that he was comfortable with me. You're right about his voice. He hated his the sound of his voice. He didn't think he had a good singing voice, and he used to say, just mess it up cover it up, just double track it, triple track it. I just don't like my voice. But I thought that he had the most amazing voice. Yeah. You know, the way yeah. he would sing the lilt, that he would sing certain words, you know. Um, but that's really, he, he gave me carte blanche. I mean, and I didn't use it. I didn't go out and do anything with them, except in my closet. <laughs> so now it's out. So now you can see, because this is never going to come around again. So here we are. Anybody else? Yes. Um, you said that you were trying to get the Beatles back together. So what, um, I guess, what did you do and what, and why don't you think it happened? A lot of it was timing. You know, everybody wanted to, um, Paul just happened to show up one day at, at our recording session for Harry Nielsen. It was on the first night. And, um, and they hadn't seen each other in a few years at that point. But they acted like they just saw each other, oh, I hate to use the pun, yesterday, you know, that type of thing. Um, and then, you know, we had George who came through town, and he was doing the Dark Horse tour, and, and they, I had to patch them up too. They had, you know, they hadn't seen each other, and George kept saying to him, you know, you, didn't, you weren't there when I needed you. And John said, I couldn't be there. And George goes, well... He says, I want to see your eyes, because, you know, John always wore sunglasses, right? So he goes, okay, so he switched the glasses out, and he put on another pair of glasses. Of course, they were tinted as well. So, and George got frustrated, and he ripped over, and went over like, like to his face and just ripped off the glasses, because I want to see your eyes. And he goes, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, no, please don't hit him. Um, no, they didn't, they were fine. And they, um, he says, okay, you see my, my eyes, what do you, you know, what do you want to say? He goes, he just stared, they just stared into each other's eyes, and he says, okay. And he turned to me, and he goes, I'm glad you're with him. And that was such a loving, you know, comment. And then he turned to John and says, I'm glad she's with you. <laughs> and just kept staring at him. And that was great, you know, and, and we would then went to see one of his shows down in, in people, uh, a few people caught us. We were backstage watching, you know, George with, in his Dark Horse tour out in Long Island. So we were, you know, we spent time together, and that, and that was good. And of course, so Paul and George, we saw Ringo, so I got all, all of them at once, so it was good. 
Anybody else? I have a question. Yo. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Her. Okay. <laughs> now, how did you get started? I don't know if anyone asked this already. How did you get started with Apple? <laughs> That's funny. Um, I was a little kid that needed a job. I, I hated school. Oh, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but I didn't like college. I didn't like anything. Music was the only thing that I loved. And nothing I was doing at you know school really was interesting. You know, you have a little short guy look like a penguin who tells me he's teaching me was it salesmanship and every morning he would come in and fling his briefcase over I think was not in, you know, inducing me to go and, and um, be in his class but I went looking for a job at this building they, they had agencies back then and I went in and um, I didn't get the job and it was a simple job because my mother would I, I was afraid to tell my mother I actually quit school so I um, turned around and I uh, went in for a receptionist job. I figured, oh, I can answer the phone. I don't have, I don't know how to type, but I can answer the phone. Hello, how are you? You know. So it was a Japanese bicycle company, and by the time I walked out, I knew I didn't get the job. Japanese, Chinese didn't work. <laughs> so I walked out, and my girlfriend was meeting me, and she saw on the on the directory. It said, Alan Klein, Apple Records, the whole thing, okay? And so that was the, so that was the, the whole thing. And I said, and she looked at me, and she saw the look on my face, and I said, well, guess what? I'm going to run upstairs. She goes, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to ask them for a job. She goes, you're crazy. I said, what could they say to me? No, I'll be right back where I started. There's no, there was no... You know, I was already at the bottom. What could they say that was going to hurt me? Except throw me out of the building, I guess. Um, so I went upstairs, and, and they were on the 41st floor. I remember getting off the elevator and looking out, and I said to this woman, she was, can I, you know, I said, I'm looking for if you have any openings. And he goes, ah, no, no, we don't have anything. I said, oh, okay. And looking dejected and I'm staring, looking at the building. God only knows what I was thinking. And she goes, uh, can I help you with something else? And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering, do the Beatles ever come here? And she just laughed and she said, no, this is just an office building. I said, okay. And I just sort of strolled back to the, to the button and said, okay, I guess I'm leaving. And, and I pressed for the button and somehow it's taking its time. I'm on the 41st floor. And all of a sudden, two doors, her, her desk was right in the middle, and there were two doors on either side. And all of a sudden, all these people were coming out, especially the men, and I didn't know what was going on. And the woman happened to ask, yelled out, this girl's looking for a job, are there any openings? And this one guy turned around and said, I might, come back after lunch. And I went, what? <laughs> okay, I will. And I left, and I'm going, lunch? Oh my God, I'm thinking, nine to five, but this was a 10 to six job. So I came at lunchtime for them. So I came back at well after two o'clock, just to be sure lunch was over. And they said, can you do statistical type? And I said, uh, I'm sure I can. I said, no. <laughs> so can you show me what that is? And it's columns. I said, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, God, no. Um, can you do this? Can you do that? And I said, oh yeah. I lied my way through that one. And then finally, I, mean, I had a couple of, I had to meet up with a couple of people and, and they said, oh great, okay, can you start Monday? I mean, how lucky was I, you know? So I said, great, and then they said, $90 a week, is that okay? $90 a week back in 1969 um, was a lot of money. So anything was a lot of money at that point for me, because I didn't have a job, I didn't have anything, so this was great. And, I, and I'm getting to work at this building that says Apple Records and Alan Klein and all this other stuff. It turned out to be, for me, the greatest working experience ever. Because not only did I work with Alan Klein, which a lot of people have heard different stories, and I could attest to working first with he wasn't the big bad wolf as a lot of people make, made him out to be. But I got a chance to work on my favorite thing, and that's music publishing. And that was working with the Sam Cooke catalog, the Rolling Stone catalog, the Apple catalog, the Cameo Parkway catalog. And it, 
three of the individual Beatles and then a lot a few of the artists uh, out of, on, on Apple Records. So I had the greatest training ever. So I, I wouldn't have traded that. And so that's where I uh, started. <laughs> it was good, right? And the woman that actually was behind the desk was not the receptionist. She just happened to be filling in for somebody right then and then. <laughs> so I was lucky. Because I don't think the receptionist would have said anything. So there. Yes? Can you expand a little on Alice Fine not being the big bad wolf? Because you're one of the people I've ever heard say something nice about it. Well, you know what? A lot of people, you know, yes, Alan had his faults. I'm not saying that he didn't. And, and one of his biggest faults was he was always thought of himself bigger than the act. But he actually made changes in the music industry and re in the record contract. Um, when the Beatles renegotiated their contract with, um, you know, with EMI and Capital, he, he got rid of the 10% the breakage fee. Which nobody ever done, you know, had done that before. So now that was taken out. There were a lot of different things. And when it came to charity events, he would buy a table all the time, and he would then also um, buy the auction at the auction and, and buy all these things, and he would pay for them. And I know a few people that had never uh, a lot of artists, um, a photographer, who needed a um, um, a bypass. Of course, he had no money, you know, that was product of the 60s and whatever, they didn't have any money and, and he needed it desperately. And Alan, and someone came to him and said, he needs this, he goes, just send, tell him to send the bill to me. And he paid for that person's, you know, hospital bill. No questions asked, nothing, he did not ask for it back. So I mean, I know the other side of it that a lot of people don't ever see. So that's the generosity. Anybody else? With any personal story that you feel comfortable, you know, sharing that you're not revealing things you don't want. Any little story about everyday life? Oh, everyday life. <laughs> well, I mean, with, with, with the man, the man would wake up at eleven o'clock. I would have his cup of coffee ready, and he didn't have sugar in his in his cup of coffee. He had half and half, um, and he would like to read the New York Times. And on Mondays, we get the delivery of all the rag newspapers, like the Daily Mail, the News of the World from England, all the, all the rag papers, because he still wanted to, to, you know, he was, he was English, and so he, he wanted to read that as part of tradition. And that's what he used to do. We used to have that sent over to us. So on Mondays, was reading that, and he would read all the music magazines, Billboard, Record World, Cashbox, and where the charts and what everybody was doing. And then he just, you know, I mean, I took John on a bus ride. I mean, that's how crazy it got with me and him. Yes? Were you upset when it ended and when you went back to Yoko? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> you answered it. Can you talk about how a toot and a snore? A toot and a snore. I happened to find out, that's which is a bootleg, and it was a, a time during the, um, the, uh, the Pussycats album, where it was a jam session, which I'm actually on the last jam session that John and Paul ever had uh, done back in 1974. It turns out that uh, I believe someone told me that it was Jesse Ed Davis, one of the musicians that, were on, that was on this album, uh, had a cassette and sold it. So that's how that bootleg went out, and it wasn't meant to, we weren't ready. You know, for anything except for a fun time. And of course, everybody said, oh, it sounds terrible, don't buy it. We weren't recording it for anybody. So that's what it was. It was well, Stevie Wonder was on it. Um, Paul was playing drums because now we didn't have a bass player, so we had to borrow somebody else from some other session. We had, um, and he broke, Paul broke Ringo's um, snare drum, and Ringo was furious the next day when he found out, and he still talks about it. <laughs> He's not very happy about it. Um, then there was uh, Linda on Hammond organ. See, and then let's see who else was me and Mal Evans, and if anybody knows who Mal Evans was, uh, we played tambourines. So, so that was and then a couple of musicians. Otherwise, everybody else left. Anybody else? Hey, um, you know, what kind of interaction did they have with the Rolling Stones and the Dave Clark Five, considering those three 
with the mercy be coming out of Well, let's London. put it this way. By that point, everybody had gone on different right. runs. Right. But at my house, in my apartment, and yes, we lived in New York City, not in L.A. We were only there for different things. But in New York City, we had Mick Jagger. He was always our visitor. We couldn't get rid of Mick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Define your role in the history of John's life. What? How do you feel? What? What is your role? How do you feel about <clears throat> being part of this history? I don't know why they define it, except the yeah. fact that I was his companion, his girlfriend, and a lot of people don't want to say that because it will disrupt somebody else. <laughs> but that's the fact. Are the facts? Yeah. And so, Yoko wasn't there. Uh, Yoko called us all the time, so she was not in, in you know, sitting all by herself. Uh, she called us all the time. She must have called about 20 times a day. I was the one who told her that, you know, when uh, they decided to do the Elton John, you know, John was going to get up to do the Elton John concert. I actually spoke to her and told her, so she knew about this. Um, there's a lot of things, and, you know, it wasn't... So for them to get back together, and that's another, there are a lot of myths. They did not get back together in November. It wasn't until the following year. She came to the concert. You know, it's just, it's, it's just whatever. And of course, there's videos out there of Number Nine Dream and, the, and her face mouthing the word of John. But it's actually my voice. So I sing on that. So, you know, it, and it's just the way it is. So I'm just trying to correct a little bit of history on the way. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Because I have a question. Oh, okay. You, you mentioned. All that right, hold <laughs> on. The, the, the last weekend was actually uh, 18 months in the relationship. Roughly 18, yeah. But I mean, you guys went back and forth from LA to New York uh, more often than not. And it, it, it wasn't all in, 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 uh, in LA. No, it was just it was, it was in both places. But the antics that you keep reading. Right, it's just all about LA. It's all about LA. But my question is did you guys fly commercial? Yes. And how did that? How do you? How did that? How did that work? What do you mean? How did that work? We bought a ticket. We got on the plane. <laughs> was he not harassed on the plane? Or? People did come up to us, and then you know, and and it got crazy. And then you know, of course, everybody was trying to like, give him drinks, and he would drink. And then of course, you get drunk. And I'm saying to the stewardess, "Stop it." <laughs> and that was about it. But no, we went. We yeah, no, we flew. In those days, we didn't have private planes. Are you crazy? <laughs> Who could afford that? What yes. That? May, were you ever there when he had an inspiration to write a song and you saw it? He said it. You know. A lot. Is, can you think of one? Like yeah. What, his his <laughs> only number one single, which is whatever gets you through the night. Okay. He he loved TV, and he loved the the advent of cable TV had just started happening. And he was watching this guy called Reverend Ike. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you know. Agree, that's yeah. Okay, yeah. Reverend Ike. Uh, and he's, you know, the guy's pacing back and forth on television, two in the morning. And he's going, you need money? You gotta ask for it. You know, and this is one of these slick things. And he said, it's whatever gets you through the night. And that phrase stuck with John. And he always had a yellow pad and pen paper, whatever, over his head. And he always had it so that he can write down phrases. And he liked that phrase, and he wrote it, and he put it, and he put it down. And from that, obviously, he wrote the song. And from whatever gets you through the night, which was his only number one in his lifetime, so he he managed to get one. So that's how that happened. I've watched him write songs. It's good. <laughs> and the true story that he made the bet without what you helped John, he said, Elton, for helping me, if this song would be number one, I will join you. On well, how it, yes, basically that's how it happened. It turned out that Elton said, okay, because we were choosing a uh, single everywhere. And then when we finally chose whatever gets you through the night, he goes, oh, this is going to be a number one. And John said, yeah, sure. And, you know, he, he never had a number one single. And so he said, okay. And no, it's not imagined. It never made number one. So... And he got to the point, and he says, okay, if it hits number one, you're going to have to come on stage with me. And he goes, okay, sure, I'll do that. Thinking that it never would make number one. And that was the reason why he did it. And of course, when it did hit number one, and, and Elton was getting ready for the stage, he actually turned around and he told John he didn't have to do it. And uh, John said, no, a bet is a bet. I'm going to go up, and I'll do it. 
um, did you have any insight on why John chose to do I Saw Her Standing There? It was a song that they wanted to choose that he didn't sing, so that it'd be on neutral ground. That was the only reason. So, of course, now everybody sings it, right? I mean, Paul sings it, you know, and everybody sings it, and you know, that song would never have been on, that, on the playlist until John made it, you know, well known on uh, at Elton's concert, so that's how it worked. Okay, yes? Do you have any friendship or relationship with his children? The only one I have a relationship with uh, is Julian, and Cynthia and I were very, very close. I saw a picture of you with her on your Facebook. Yes, and that it was the actually that that picture of me and Cynthia was actually the last photo of us together. Uh, I went to see her after her husband died, so I went to Spain, and um, sorry, that was the last time I saw her. But she would call me. So, yes, so that was it. Okay, I think I want to turn this over <laughs> to, <laughs> to Tim, uh, Tim Bruckner, who created a, a fabulous sculpture and things like that around here. And here, I'm going to turn it over before I become a puddle. <laughs>